Hello and welcome to the webinar on Starting Up Small-Scale Organic Hops Production by Rob Sarine of Michigan State University and Brian Tennis of the Michigan Hop Alliance. My name is Alice Formiga and I'm the webinar coordinator for eOrganic. eOrganic is the organic agriculture community of practice with extension.org. We're a community of cooperative extension service personnel, researchers, ag professionals, organic certifiers, and practitioners. You can find all of our public, published articles and videos on organic farming on our website at extension.org slash organic underscore production. We've been running a series of webinars with North Central SARE, and you can find our upcoming and recorded webinars on that site. We're very glad to be able to host Rob Sarine and Brian Tennis today. Rob is a community food systems educator for Michigan State University Extension. Rob serves as the statewide lead for Michigan hops production. With increasing interest from Michigan microbrewers and home brewers, Rob has organized a series of educational sessions and on-farm field days for growers interested in hops production over the last three years. Moreover, he's been involved in several statewide and multi-state grant initiatives investigating the potential for sustainable hop production in the Great Lakes region. Brian Tennis and his wife Amy operate New Mission Organics Farm in Michigan. They have been farming organically for the past six years. In addition to five acres of hops, they also grow organic sweet cherries. Brian and Amy are members of the Michigan Hop Alliance, a group of five organic hop growers in northwest Michigan that work together to pick, process, and package their hops for sale to micro and home brewers. Also online with us today is Vicki Marone of Michigan State University CS Mott Group, who has organized a series of webinars. She'll be moderating the questions after the presentation. Rob and Brian will speak for 45 minutes, and then we'll have a 30-minute question and answer period. If you have a question at any time during the presentation, you can simply type it into the question box on your screen and hit return. If you don't see the question box, click the small plus sign next to the word question on your control panel to open it up. We'll be reading the questions out loud, and we'll answer as many as we have time for. So in just a moment, I'm going to hand things over to you, Rob. Um, in just a second, you should have control of the screen. Okay. All right. Well, welcome, everyone. I um, hope everyone enjoys that picture at the bottom there of Brian and I on our way over to the uh, USDA Organic NOSB meeting in Madison. That's how we got across the lake on that hovercraft. Uh, welcome to our Small Scale Organic Ops Production webinar uh, with MSU Extension and the Michigan Hop Alliance. Let's see if this works. There we go. It's taking a little bit of delay. But here's the outline for today. Um, first, we'll talk a little bit about the history, uh, kind of the natural history and taxonomy of hops, characteristics and growth habits, some growing requirements, pest and disease management, um, trellising, uh, some of the market trends. And we'll also throw in the uh, cost of production as well. And then end with um, just a brief mention of our research trials in this area. and leave you with three pages of resources. Okay, in the early uh, 1600, um, the Dutch were probably the first to bring hops into the New World. Um, there were native hops in the woods, but Dutch law required that hops to be imported, um, probably from uh, Europe. New England uh, colonists were the first to establish cultivated hops crops as early as uh, 1628, and the lovely state of Massachusetts promoted healthy malted beverages beer. Um, so folks probably used imported locally grown and wild hops back in the day to make beer. Um, an excellent resource on this is the book uh, Tinged with Gold by Tomlin, uh, 1992, a whole history of hop production around the world. Great resource. Okay, so 1839 you can see um, eastern part of the United States, New York State, uh, Massachusetts, uh, Vermont, had uh, hops production by 1859, um, big production in New York State. They were the leaders. A uh, little bit of production in Wisconsin, and one bale is 200 pounds of dried hops. So each dot represented 100,000 bales. So that's quite a bit of production. Hops did gain a foothold in the U.S. Um, 1879, you can see it spread across uh, the United States, even some production in Michigan there, right down there in southwest Michigan. Um, but by 1899, look how things have changed. Um, with uh, disease and pests, uh, 
outbreaks and the advent of the railroad and um, double yields out in uh, the West Coast, first in California and then up into uh, Yakima, um, most of the production switched uh, to the Pacific Northwest by 1920. Sorry for the delay there. I'm going to try to uh, time things a little bit better. Um, <clears throat> this is a publication from uh, Wisconsin in the uh, looks like the 1890s. Um, hops are king wherever they're raised in the Northwest. At that time, Wisconsin might have been considered the Northwest, um, but they're getting $700 to $800 per acre. And if you do the math on that um, with inflation, it's hundreds of thousands of dollars an acre. So they probably were uh, more profitable than a gold mine as it states right there. So there is a history of uh, hop production in the Great Lakes region. Um, switching over to the natural his history, Humulus is the genus. It's a herbaceous climbing plant, um, most likely originated in China where you find all the different species still uh, growing today. But it's indigenous to uh, basically the northern hemisphere, Asia, Europe, North America. It's one of two genera in the Cannabinaceae family. The other is cannabis. Um, there's three distinct species, Lupulus, Japonicus, and Unanensis, um, but all the commercial hops are um, of the Humulus Lupulus species. So what are hops? They're dioecious, so um, male and females are different plants. They're perennial um, below ground, but annual above ground. So each year, annual growth um, kicks off from an overwintering perennial rhizome. They grab on by trichomes, which are stout little hairs. Um, they're called vines with a B rather than vines because they have these trichomes. Vines have tendrils. Um, think of the difference between uh, a vine and a vine there. Um, only the female flower or the strobial, uh, um, the cone is what we call them, is desirable for use in beer production. So these cones are uh, light green, papery, anywhere from a half inch up to four inches long. And they contain the uh, lupulin glands that are um, uh, used for beer production. So what is lupulin? It uh, has the essential oils that contribute to the aroma. You can see the little yellow uh, sticky substances there. Um, and the soft resins that have the beta acids and all the important uh, alpha acids as well. Nice photo from Hop Union. So propagation typically is from rhizomes, which are the uh, underground stem that emerges from the plant roots. But increasingly, um, we're also seeing uh, outfits that sell um, potted plants as well. The nice thing about potted plants is um, they can be certified disease and virus free. They're a little more expensive, um, but if you have uh, an area that's um, prone to disease, um, it's nice to know that um, the, the stock you're getting is disease and virus free um, before you plant. So some site and uh, soil requirements. Um, hops require long day lengths. Uh, they have specific chilling requirements uh, in the winter time <coughs> um, below 40 degrees for one to two months. That's, we definitely meet that uh, up here in northern Michigan. Um, but those chilling requirements are rarely satisfied below 35 degrees, although I have heard of some production up in the mountains in North Carolina as well. Um, 124 hours free days, full day sun, um, good air circulation to prevent disease issues. Um, they have uh, roots that go down pretty darn far, 20, 30 feet. So they like uh, sandy loam, well-drained soils, although I have seen hops growing behind my parents' house in the swamp. But as far as production goes uh, for commercial operations, um, sandy loam, sandy soils are best. Um, obviously avoid shallow bedrock and uh, shallow water tables. Um, for that reason. Um, planting, thinning, training, stripping. Brian, do you want to talk about this? Sure. Here in Michigan, we usually start um, Memorial Day. We want to get everything planted, give or take. Um, the spacing here is typically two and a half to three feet per hill. That is where each rhizome is planted, you want at least that much um, between each plant because they will grow into each other. They're a voracious growing plant. And the, um, after the first uh, six or seven weeks in the spring, we'll go through and thin these plants, which you can either 
um, do it by hand um, with cutters or some of the folks out in New Zealand and a few other areas actually use sheep because sheep will go through there, they'll eat the bottom um, two or three feet of the leaves so you don't have to go up there and manually do it. There's also some um, organic sprays that you can use on them. Um, we've had hit and miss results with those and they're extremely expensive so we're just um, doing it by hand and you can you can tell if you've got a thousand plants per acre it's going to take a long time to do that so it's it's necessary you've got to do it one for uh, growth purposes and two you want to get as much wind through those plants as possible we train uh, at least two binds per rope um, some guys out in Yakima um, Stacy over at uh, Peterborough Farms they train everything but um, here in Michigan we found that you know, two or three binds per per, per rope is, is is fine. Um, we'll also um, uh, what's the other thing? Um, yeah, the stripping stripping is essential because if you don't do that, you'll stunt you stunt the plant growth, and um, you definitely end up with a reduced yield if you don't do, do that. It's kind of a pain, but it, it's certainly necessary. Um, one thing you want to definitely do before you plant is check, um, do your soil tests, send it into your local extension. It's critical that you, you know what you're dealing with in terms of soil. Um, pH is, is critical. So get those tests in there as soon as you can. And another thing that you really have to consider is the amount of nitrogen that these plants take up. Each year it's at least 100 to 140 pounds of pure N per acre that these plants are using. So you try to extrapolate that from manure and compost and that is going to be a lot of poop. A lot of phosphorus and potassium. There's also um, uh, boron and other micronutrients that um, a soil test will certainly help you out with. Um, what we do um, in on top of uh, composting is also use um, a product from Manitowoc, Wisconsin called DRAM. It's uh, basically Chilean nitrate, um, kelp, and fish emulsion. But um, we use it as a foliar application, but you really need to be careful on when you spray that, just like any other spray. We always spray right, um, right at dusk, but even then, some of the Chilean nitrate will get on those leaves, and if you're not careful, it could make them really crispy, and it's not a good thing. Also, um, we will do cover crops just to keep the, uh, the weeds down, which is absolutely critical if you're in a, an organic situation. So we'll go through even before we plant um, plant a cover crop, say uh, buckwheat, get all the weeds out of there and then go back in and plant clover right into that just to keep um, your weed pressure down and maybe get a little bit of um, N put back in the soil. Also um, if you're using compost, um, try to use something that's super high in end like um, chicken manure, feather meal, bone meal, etc. It's not going to be cheap but um, you definitely you'll be amazed at, at how much compost you're going to be putting on these plants. You want to take over on this one? Rob? Yeah, thanks Brian. Um, nitrogen is key. Um, <clears throat> Some folks here are putting even up to uh, 200 and 250 pounds of nitrogen on, which is difficult to get uh, in organic systems because it has to be mineralized into the form that the plants can uptake. Um, so we've had some issues getting the yields that we need or that are comparable with conventional productions. Ideally, if you could find a, uh, a way of fertigating, um, getting nutrients through your drip irrigation that is um, uh, on par with that, 200 pounds of nitrogen. That way you could baby baby uh, spoon feed the plants rather than dumping all that on at once because uh, the nitrogen use efficiency for a, a tree orchard crop is typically about 
25%, which means 75% of the nitrogen you dump on either goes up into the atmosphere or um, through the soil into the groundwater. So more, more often, um, more applications more often, smaller amounts is the best thing you can do. Um, that might be the one big issue in organic production, which is why we're going to need a price premium. Um, irrigation, we use, uh, we've got RAM uh, pressure compensating emitters, so if they're on a hill, um, you get the same amount out of each emitter. Um, we have them every two feet at the research station here, but uh, ideally you put your plants in and then put the emitters in right where the plants are so you're not watering the weeds. Water May through September at least four hours a day, um, even, even up to eight hours a day um, in the hot, dry months. Um, so that's irrigation. We talked about uh, fertility. Here's just an example of a soil test for our hop yard. Um, it's at the research station. It's a former uh, cherry orchard. And look at, look at the phosphorus load, way over optimum. That's what we see quite a bit here. So important to uh, test for uh, or do a soil test before you um, um, start amending the soil. So we're going to switch over to pests and disease. And uh, Brian and I will probably switch off here on some of these. Um, a couple of the biggest pests here in uh, Michigan are the aphid and uh, spider, spider mites. Um, also, you have a whole series of viruses and viroids that are um, potential issues. We haven't seen much of that here yet. Um, the biggest disease is downy and um, powdery mildew. Both of those are uh, really important. Um, so first, let's talk about some of the pests, spider mites. Um, we got nailed with these this year pretty good. I went out of town for a week and came back, and um, they, just, they just came up real quick. You can see this bold right here. Um, they can build up real rapidly, especially in hot, dry conditions, so it's essential to monitor. Um, they feed on the leaves and the cones, sucking the juice from the cells, and they turn the leaves kind of brown or bronzing, and they reduce the plant vigor. Um, so start monitoring er early. And here's the catch-22 with insect um, issues and disease issues is avoid excess nitrogen fertility. Um, so on one hand, you want a lot of nitrogen. Um, on the other hand, you don't want that much nitrogen because it creates a lush green plant uh, tissue for um, pests. Um, reduce dust, especially in hot conditions. Um, and you can come back and, and read these. Um, you can treat when you get about one to two female spider mites per leaf in June, or uh, maybe five to ten mites per, uh, mites per leaf after mid-July, knowing that the hot plant can tolerate much higher concentrations of these, but you just, don't, you just want to make sure that um, they're not in the cone. So really essential to monitor. Uh, source down here at the bottom, um, this is a great book. I'll put a picture up of it uh, in a second. Um, but that's, um, for any pest or disease question, you should get that hop handbook. Uh, you see the webbing there at the bottom. Aphids are the other one. Um, we haven't had a problem with these. Brian has on his farm. These respond fairly well to uh, biological control with um, uh, ladybugs, lacewings, and other uh, uh, natural predators. Also important to, uh, to monitor these. Um, you do not want aphids in the cones. Um, obviously, uh, for if you're going to use chemical control, avoid using the same chemical over and over so they don't build up resistance. There is not really a comprehensive uh, economic threshold for these, um, but most growers apply a pesticide when you get about five to ten aphids per leaf um, before flowering. Typically, aphids are not tolerated after um, after the cones are present because the aphids can infest the cones, uh, which you do not want. Um, a couple of diseases here we mentioned. Uh, powdery is uh, extremely um, spreadable, readily spread at all stages. So good sanitation is the key for disease control. It starts with that uh, cultural control. Any vines that you see that have this, you cut them away, you get them out of there, and you burn them. Um, Brian talked about stripping the lower leaves. That's important to create airflow in the uh, hop yard. And then um, also, again, avoid heavy doses of nitrogen. That's why it's nice to, to spoon feed it if you can. Um, sulfur, sulfur-based fungicides are, the, are basically what's used to control powdery mildew uh, in the organic realm. It's, it's cheap. It even works in conventional, and that's why folks use it, because it is fairly inexpensive. Um, note on the bottom there, make sure that if you're using different sulfur formulations, 
that the wetting agents aren't prohibited by organic. So always make sure that you talk to your certifier before you put anything on um, and so they can investigate your plan. Um, Downey is the next one coming up. Uh, here's some pictures. Single most devastating disease in western hop yards in Oregon. Their entire production systems are run around downy mildew management. Um, typically first noticed um, as the young vines come up on the left you see these uh, basal spikes. Ends up discoloring the cones, uh, affects the leaves, the plants. You see these lesions and it just dramatically reduces yields. Um, again with uh, like powdery the best way is to uh, use cultural control, um, prune the crown before growth starts to burn back some of that green tissue before training. Um, remove disease hills and all around them because um, you do not want this in your yard. Um, you can use resistant varieties as well. Again, avoid overhead irrigation. Uh, we don't do any of that around here. Um, stripping the leaves, Brian talked about that. Uh, from an organic perspective, most of the downy mildew is controlled by uh, copper-based fungicides. Um, just make sure whatever you use is registered in your state because there are different um, products registered in different states. I found uh, greenbook.net. If you go on there and log in, you can put in the, your state and the crop and it comes up with most of the um, chemistries that are certified, including organic. Here's a, uh, a list um, based on Pacific Northwest data of the different varieties. So if you want to avoid uh, downy mildew or powdery mildew, plant a, a variety that's resistant. Verticillium wilt's another one. Um, we don't really have time to get into all the different diseases, but um, this chart you can find in uh, uh, it's a great publication, um, the slide after this. Um, this is just an example from New Zealand. They have a whole different um, whole different way of growing down there because they don't have much in terms of disease pressure. Um, they use dried blood and bone meal and bone fertilizers. They use liquid organic fertilizers. I don't know what they use. Cause I'm, I'm, we're going there in February, so I want to figure out uh, what they use to see if we can adapt that here. Um, they use rock phosphate and lime. They use natural dolomite for uh, magnesium. They control two-spotted spider mites with uh, predator mites. And then they've got an innovative cover cropping scheme that they also incorporate, uh, incorporate sheep into as well. And Brian talked about the importance of using cover crops. So if my memory serves, the next slide will be um, one of the best resources. There it is. So Field Guide for Integrative Pest Management and Hops, you can just Google that. It'll pop up as a PDF. You can download it. And then um, the Compendium of Hop Diseases and Pests, kind of both of these together are the hop bibles for anyone who uh, is really interested in growing um, hops. You need to have both of these on your shelf. Um, and a lot of the information from this talk is coming from these books. Um, let's see what we got next. So, for instance, in the books, too, the, it's a nice guide. Uh, top left, two pictures show uh, iron deficiency. So if you see that in your, in your yard, you can bring the book out, look at it. It's real nice. Uh, this could be iron deficiency. You could get your soil tested, get your uh, tissue tested just to make sure. So there's picture like, pictures like these all throughout the book. Um, so I highly recommend those if you're interested. Now I'm going to have Brian talk a little bit about um, the difference between the conventional high trellis and uh, low trellis systems. And that's his farm on the uh, left there. Thank you, Rob. Um, wrapping up real quickly on the bugs and mildew, a couple of takeaway points. Um, diatomaceous earth and ladybugs and predatory mites are what we use and we found in the organic setting, nothing beats that. Also, um, take a take a really close look at when you're tilling. Um, you can't till in the summer, especially when it's dusty, because all that dust will get on the plants and it will have a huge mite infestation. Also, um, if, if the bug pressure gets bad enough, you'll start getting this black sooty mold in the cones. Once you get to that stage, um, your crop is pretty much done, and the brewers will not use them. Same if you have uh, too many female plants in there, or male plants, excuse me, um, if you get a bunch of seeds in your in your field and you bring them to the brewer, it's going to give them some off taste, and they're certainly not going to use that. So again, um, trim around the base of your plants. Make sure you got good good uh, airflow going through there, and certainly look at planting hot uh, mildew resistant varieties. And um, 
you should be should be ahead of the game there. Fortunately, in the Midwest and especially in Michigan and Leland, we don't have a lot of the um, the mildew pressures right now. It could be site specific where our farm is, but we haven't seen any uh, downy or powdery mildew uh, knock on wood. Switch to conventional high trellis. Um, here in Leland, our yards are 18 feet tall. Spacing is can be anywhere from 30 to 40 feet between the poles. And um, depending on how wide your rows are, it could be you know, 12, 14, 16 feet wide. It really is dependent on one, the equipment that you have, the amount of land and acreage that you have. And you also have to keep in mind um, that these plants are going to grow. And maybe you know, the first year or, first or second year, you can get away with one rope going straight up. But then you're going to have to V these plants out, which dramatically impacts on your tractor getting through those rows. So it's take a look at um, your equipment. That's, that's really one of the keys to planting this high trellis. We use um, 3 16 and 5 16 galvanized wires for, for the trellising system and then um, secure them with earth anchors. We really don't have a lot of time to go into the minute details on that, but um, we can certainly get you that information. Um, the telephone poles are critical as well. If you're in, um, if you're in an organic setting, you've got to use untreated poles. Um, Despite what your certifier may tell you, and we ran into a, that issue ourselves. One minute was fine to use the treated poles, next minute it's not. So if you can, um, start out with um, untreated poles. We use black locust now. It's a, it's a phenomenal wood. It's one of the hardest woods in North America. And fortunately, in our area, it's readily available. But um, there's certainly some substitutes out there. and. Uh, you want to get them, you know, uh, 22 feet, 21 feet tall, bury them three to four feet down, and and you should be good. You really don't want to get them over 18 feet because they're not going to grow more than that anyway. If you do any any shorter than that, then they're going to lop over the top, and you're going to have a real mess. Um, it's also extremely important to anchor these poles on the ends. We use um, earth anchors that are buried three feet down in the um, down into the earth and angled. Um, you would be amazed at the amount of weight that gets on these plants after um, first few years. So don't skimp out. Get some big poles. Ours are usually 10 to 12 inches um, minimum. And uh, that's all the, going all the way up to the top. So you can get away with, with smaller and thinner poles, but it will come back to bite you. Um, fortunately, this year we were uh, privileged to be working with some of the growers um, out in Yakima, and we planted Summit, which is a, a semi-dwarf variety. It only grows to like 10 feet tall. And so we put in three acres of a short trellis this year. It's um, 10 to 12 feet tall poles and 30 feet between the spans and our rows are only 10 feet, 10, 11 feet wide because there's no overhead wires and there's a, just a single strand going straight up. So these plants are actually um, almost like a shrub. They grow hops all the way from the bottom um, near, the, near the ground all the way up to the very top and it's, um, it's a pretty exciting plant to grow because you're cost is um, dramatically cheaper. You can just run down the, your row with an auger, drill the hole, have one of your lackeys. In, in my case, Rob helped me out, but he uh, actually, the poles are, are as manageable enough where you can actually pick them up and put them in the hole yourself if you're, if you're big enough. If Rob can do it, anybody can do it. So you're looking at lo much lower cost to put in a hop yard. It's much quicker. Um, but the only drawback is there's only a few varieties out there that are available to be planted. Unfortunately, the summit that we got is proprietary. We had to sign a contract. And we're, as far as I know, we're one of the only growers outside of the Pacific Northwest that can legally grow it. I know um, 
guys over in England are been experimenting with a lot of um, semi-dwarf varieties for years, but most of them um, haven't really all been that um, the yields have been less than what we expect, and it's still a work in progress, put it, put it that way. Um, what are we looking at here, Mr. Serene? Oh, you want to you wanna jump in that? Ah. So uh, one of the research projects we're working on is um, a collaboration with Washington State University. Uh, Dr. Kevin Murphy out there is the uh, project director, uh, MSU and um, University of Vermont. I think University of Colorado as well. Um, so we went out to Yakima. Um, this is Loftus Ranches. You can see the uh, harvesting of the hops here. They're uh, cutting them down. They cut them down at the bottom and at the top, put them into this trailer. Um, pretty pretty nifty outfit they have out there. Um, they're, I'll go through some of these slides that will show some of the picking and the, and the processing. This is huge scale. We were blown away by um, how large the scale is here. They've got, you know, Bays for five trucks to come in. Um, so these trucks back in, the uh, hot vines are hooked on um, to a cable that pulls them up through the picking machine. And it's like an MC Escher drawing, if you're familiar with that. It's going up and down and around, and you can't even really tell where you are in this huge building. But it, basically, it's a huge uh, machine that separates the cones from the vines and the leaves. And um, so the smaller scale version is what we have. See on the left here, you can see it comes out minus the uh, the cones. Uh, just imagine there's looping and flying around all over the place, and it's super loud. It's awesome if you, if you like hops and uh, beer, like Brian does. Um, there's Brian right there. Sexy man. <laughs> so uh, through the series of uh, I don't know, it's kind of like a, a waterfall of hops. Um, they, they get separated. The leftover they, uh, goes out under the ground onto these huge piles where they're um, taken back and composted. Um, yeah, when we went out there, the scale was just a very impressive. Um, they're a big time operation. So, small time organic, I don't really see competing with these guys. This is a drying um, area here with big ovens underneath. Um, it's about the size of a football field, three feet deep. Uh, so that's a lot of hops right there. Um, so basically, um, then they're taken, uh, dumped, and uh, this is after they're dried, they're conditioned, and then they're put into uh, huge bales. Um, you can see at the top, um, the, the, the hops come down, and they're uh, put into these big bales, uh, and then they're sewn up by hand. Um, let's see what the next one is. There's our group. So this, these guys sew these up in about 10 seconds. They can sew that up. They're compressed and stored. Most of these go to the, the bigger breweries, the mega breweries. Here's a small scale version of that uh, little wolf picking machine. So um, if you have anything more than a half acre, you're going to need some sort of a picking machine. If you're planning on picking the hops by hand, you're not going to make money if you have to pay the labor. If you have free labor, it might work. but um, uh, you're going to upset a lot of your friends, and they're not going to come back, um, even if you give them beer. Brian ran into that issue. Here's a drying, small-scale drying um, oven, and you can see the crates on the left, the screens on the bottom that are put in. This is kind of a, a test plot here. And then eventually they're pelletized um, and then tested. This is Bravo. You can see the alpha acid percent there. Um, this is from Hops Direct. A um, little bit about global trends real quick. We've got about uh, 10 minutes left here um, for questions. Germany is the worldwide leader. Um, U.S. is second. Uh, you can see the big drop off though from 2009 to 2010 in the U.S. About 8,000 acres were taken out because of the price. Um, here you go again. Washington um, dropped off. Oregon's off. Idaho's down. Average hop yields, and these are um, by far most of the hops are uh, conventionally produced. So, if you can get 2,000 pounds an acre organic, you're doing great. Um, I'm assuming we're going to get about half that probably, which is why I think we need a price premium to be competitive. 
Um, here's the average prices. Um, this is national average, so in certain locales it could be more than this. Three, four dollars a pound. Um, smaller scale, if you're selling to microbrews, I've heard upwards of even ten dollars a pound. Uh, here's a um, a publication though. Uh, estimated cost of producing hops in Yakima. This is 09. They produce 80 percent of U.S. production. Um, Acreage expected to decline 30 uh, percent, consequence of worldwide oversupply. So this crop is up and down um, if you're producing for the you know the global commodity market. Um, so for small scale organic, I don't see us competing in that market. They just have economies of scale and they know what they're doing. Um, so I think uh, organic uh, could potentially just be a smaller niche market. Um, so here's the national summary. 80% grown in Washington, uh, most grown in Washington and Oregon, Idaho together. Zeus and Columbus and Tomahawk leading varieties. Um, in Oregon, Nugget and Willamette were um, most of the state's production. Michigan's moving on up slowly. Um, one nice thing uh, for organic, um, and the NOSB ruled in uh, 2010 to, uh, uh, they voted in favor of removing hops from the Section 205-606 list, um, which basically means that by 2013, in order to make organic beer, certified organic beer, you have to use organic hops. In the past, um, there was not enough of a supply, um, which was stifling uh, um, any research and production in organic hops because uh, organic brewers could just use whatever hops they wanted. Um, well, that's changing in 2013, um, mostly based on the leadership of the guys out west and the uh, American Organic uh, Hop Growers Association, thanks to them. So this is one uh, nice good news story for organic hop producers because um, there are some out there who make organic beer and starting January 1, 2013, they're going to have to be using organic hops. Another, another uh, nice trend happening here is that these are all the breweries planned. Um, for 2011 this year, and you can see in uh, certain areas uh, that uh, there's more breweries going in, so that's good for hop growers. Uh, we did a survey of Michigan brewers uh, two years ago, and this is what they used. Most used Cascade, Centennial, uh, also Pearl, Saws, and Simcoe, and then you can you can see the rest there. Most noted uh, that Cascade was the uh, number one variety. And brewers wish they had more of these, and these are all, um, I'm not sure if Saz is proprietary, but uh, Amarillo, Simcoe, and Summit are all proprietary. So um, the folks who develop those have sole control over those. And Brian. <laughs> um, so will brewers pay a premium? premium? This is important. Um, this is also from our survey. Yes, they will. Um, it looks like um, if you're Growing local and organic hops, um, about 50% of the brewers will pay 1 to 10% premium. Uh, another 40% would pay 10 to 25%, so uh, above normal prices. And this is good for them too because they can market, you know, their beer as um, using local ingredients. Brewers really want quality, um, uh, not only quality hops, but they need to know. Um, alpha and beta acid content, cohumulo content, total oil, HSI, all of these things. And they want the hops pelletized by and large. Um, for the most part, brewers want them. That's how their equipment is set up. Um, <clears throat> so there is kind of a bottleneck in our industry. Hops are fairly easy to grow, um, less so organically. But if you don't have a picking machine, and we'll talk about this later, and um, the processing equipment, which is a hefty investment, um, you're going to be kind of uh, um, having a hard time getting into that business. Um, if you drink too much hops, also there's uh, secondary markets. Um, let's see, hops, it says here right on the bottom right that uh, not only do they ca uh, cure constipation, but they also cure that dull feeling in the head. So there's alternative markets, hop ointment used by uh, leading actresses. That's from the back. So uh, research trials, we've got three different ones going on right now. Um, we got one at the uh, Northwest Michigan Horticulture Research Station investigating hot varieties for Michigan production. Um, the um, national study I talked about led by Dr. Kevin Murphy, that's the uh, organic, USDA organic grant. And then um, Brian wrote a, uh, a SARE grant, a North Central Region SARE grant, um, 
for um, using uh, low trellis production. So we're basically going to be testing yield differences between low trellis and high trellis. Here's our research station plot. It's about a quarter acre. You can see we used hefty poles and angled them back there. Um, even a quarter acre is a heck of a lot of work. Um, here's the cost. This is a kind of an overestimate of the cost, but anywhere from ten to twelve thousand dollars an acre is what you're talking to get these established. Here's the varieties we're testing. And we should have some fairly good data um, in the next couple of years. Here's Brian's. You can see his black locust poles there. Um, doing uh, eight different cover crop treatments in twenty different hop varieties, as I mentioned, in three different states. We'll have some interesting data on that as well in the next couple of years. And um, here's the SARE grant coming up. You can see the short trellis in the foreground, um, quite a bit shorter. So we want to look at the growth habit, the yields of Summit, um, and we're also doing uh, uh, nitrogen cover crops and, and testing those and doing a cost-benefit analysis of low trellis versus high trellis. Again, Brian mentioned low trellis, lower cost, but uh, lower yield as well. So take home here, quality is crucial if you're going to get into this business. Brewers, if they can spend, you know, four or five, six dollars a pound on hops, getting quality hops from the Pacific Northwest, there's no reason they're going to spend ten to twelve to get them from a local source if the quality isn't there. Um, high initial cost and uh, annual cost with the, with questionable returns. It depends on if we can get down your fertility management. Also, don't underestimate the amount of labor required. It's a heck of a lot of labor at certain times of the year. If you put in more than, I'd say, a half acre, you're going to need to find a picking machine. Um, and that's why I think we need a, a, a price premium for organic. Here's some costs. Picking machine, depending upon what size you get, anywhere from fifty dollars to $100,000. Hammer mill pelletizer, 8 to 15 a vacuum sealer, a dryer, 12000 and up. Obviously, this all depends on your scale. Energy is $1.50 a pound. Cold storage, we don't really know yet. And then labor, um, a guy around our area who has eight acres of hops, um, he's got about a crew of six that he uses for two months working 10-hour days. So that's quite a bit of work. You're not just going to sit on your tractor and expect to, uh, to get this done. Um, let's see what else we have here. I think I have resources coming up. Yep. We've got a MSU Extension Bulletin online and soon to be live hops.msu.edu website. It'll have all these. It's not quite ready yet, um, but we're populating that right now. So look back for that. Um, and also, I believe this uh, website, yep, uh, will be, there'll be PDF size of this and the recording available. So I'm just going to go through these real quick. Um, we've got lots of resources listed here, um, different books, field guides, that sort of thing. Um, pests and diseases, plant suppliers if you're interested in plants, and or uh, rhizome sales as well. Um, other resources, American Organic Hop Grower Association, I'd recommend getting in contact with them if you're an organic grower and um, maybe signing up to become a grower member. So thanks to all these folks for helping us in uh, the Michigan area. Um, I think our last slide's coming up right there. So we'd be happy to take any questions you have. Yeah, um, thank you, Rob. Thank you, Rob. Thank you. And, um, Brian, I just wanted to let people know again um, how they can answer, how they can ask their questions. Um, for anyone who came on a little bit after the beginning of the presentation, um, you can use the question box on your screen to just type in questions and hit return. And if you don't see the question box, you can just click the small plus sign next to the word question to open it up. And uh, we'll be reading the questions out loud, and we'll answer as many as we have time for. We've got a lot of people on, so I'm not sure if we'll be able to get to all the questions. Um, but um, we have some resources for you. Um, we've already posted in your chat box, you can kind of see that we posted the um, PDF of a handout of these slides um, on the registration page for this webinar, um, and the link is in your chat box. Um, you can also look on your screen here. I have the link posted. And we'll probably, if they're too small to read, we'll post the resources later today as a separate um, PDF. 
Um, so now I'm going to hand things over to um, Vicki Marone. Oh, I just wanted to say one more thing. Um, we really value your feedback, and so later today you'll also be receiving an email um, containing a follow-up survey, and we'd appreciate it if you could fill that out. If you have additional questions, um, you can always use the e-extension Ask an Expert service, and you'll get an answer from there. So now I'm going to hand things over to you, Vicki, and um, she'll take questions. Hello? Thank you. Hi. Yep, we hear Hi. you. Okay. Uh, so our first question, I have summed some questions up, so please be patient. Your question may be intertwined with others so that we can get through as many as possible. We have some questions about uh, cultivars, which are appropriate based on geographical location, and also consider which of the types of aromatic versus bitters versus others are more appropriate for a beginner farmer versus a uh, more experienced farmer. Rob? Sure. Um, well, it really depends on where you're located, uh, which varieties. The ones that have done really well here in our area, and that's why we're doing this research uh, variety trials, is to see what grows well here. Um, Cascades have done well, um, but by far our best um, variety has been Brewer's Gold. Um, and so but you're going to you want to... Where, where growers from other parts of the U.S. could find their um, sources of, of preferred varieties? I would look on the, uh, the on the resources slides we put up, um, Vicky. And Hop Union is a good resource. Um, it's all. It also depends on uh, not only where you are, but what your brewers want, and if you have disease issues, like I mentioned, um, uh, the IPM guide has the list of uh, resistant and moderately resistant varieties. So it's kind of a combination of all of those um, different factors you need to take into account. Obviously, if you could plant plant, you know. Uh, Ten different varieties on your farm, maybe a few plants each to see what grows well. Um, that's what I would recommend before you go and put in five acres of one variety. That's a really good point. Thank you. Good, good idea. Start I would also and grow pay um, close attention to to the actual yields of, of some of these plants. Um, for example, size size is not going to yield very well. It could be you know three or four hundred pounds an acre, where a, a Cascade or a Chinook could be you know well over a thousand so take take special care to look at um, the yields of these plants even out in the Pacific Northwest if it if it, it's not yielding very well over there chances are it's not going to yield here there's a lot of noble varieties that we simply can't grow due, due to our climate um, hollow tower size immediately come to mind but there are you know, dozens of hops that we can plant here and do really well Cascades, Centennial, Chinook, Nugget, um, Magnum, a lot of these do really, really well. So okay, it's, great. it really depends, and it's some of it is site-specific, too. You, you've got to um, have a well-drained and super sunny um, location. If not, then you're, you're kind of shooting your foot even before you get going. Okay, great. Thank you. So how about several... Uh, listeners asked about thinning and stripping. They didn't quite understand the difference between that and also uh, if you could explain the process of how that's done, if it's done with uh, pruners or by hand or and, and even if you can share what, what happens when the sheep feed upon it, what is happening, you know, where, what are they eating and what are they not eating? Oh, sure. The, the stripping and trimming is basically the same thing. You're just cutting the leaves off the, the bottom two or three feet of, of these plants. Um, one, so you promote growth to the to the top of the plant. Two, to get the airflow going. Um, the sheep will just chew the bottom two or three, four feet of the plant. They won't actually chew the binds, but they will eat the leaves. So it's um, something we haven't tried yet in our farm, but it's certainly something we're going to look at doing this year. And we're actually going to uh, New Zealand this February to, to study that very thing, having sheep run through the yards. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you. So here, Rick, yeah, uh, I wonder what, what lamb tastes like, cop-infused lamb, so we'll find out. Can I um, well, follow up on that real quick, too? Sure. Uh, Brian's right. Thinning and stripping are very similar. Thinning is basically... Um, once you get these shoots coming out of the ground, you'll get six, eight shoots, but you don't want all of those climbing up the string. So basically, you just cut them down until you get two or three per um, string. 
So that's basically you're thinning them out um, to give those two or three vines uh, a better chance of growing up, and then stripping, you're just stripping the leaves off. And it's just it's just a one-time um, deal too. Once you trim them back, you know the bottom three feet or so, you do that once. It's not like you're going to be doing that through the entire summer. Once you once you do it, it's pretty much done. Yep, that's a good point. Uh, then regarding the the plant, once you uh, have planted the perennial rhizome and you have your annual top, how old is the rhizome before you can expect maximum hop production? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it depends a lot on your fertility. Um, I'd say probably three years. Um, you, in the first year, they'll maybe grow up half, maybe uh, you know eight feet. The second year, you can get some of the top of the wire, depending upon the variety and your fertility management. But um, by the third year, you should be in uh, full production. And these things grow maybe in the prime of the summer under optimal conditions up to a foot a day, 10 to 12 inches a day. So you can see they need a lot of nitrogen and water. OK, on that topic with nitrogen, how, do you uh, apply the nitrogen since you're applying it in organic form? How are you managing it so to minimize leaching and maximize uptake by the plant? Well, we do um, three to four applications each season. We get a certified organic compost, in our case it's from Morgan's, and we just will go through and lightly um, spread. We actually have um, like an orchard or a vineyard spreader, so we'll go through there and um, just lightly put the compost right on top of the plant. We also will do a, a really light foiler application with um, the DRAM, and that's maybe you know once a month or so. So there's not a lot of uh, leaching that's even available. We do it really, really light, where the conventional guys, they will go out there and just blast it. So we're 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 spoon feeding just like Rob said. Okay. Yeah, that's why it's important also, Vicky, to uh if you can have a, a fertigation unit where you can just run your um nitrogen through your irrigation. Um and so that's kind of why we're one of the reasons we want to go to New Zealand and see is they're using liquid fertilizer. So if we can figure out a way to uh get a, a liquid organic fertilizer through those emitters uh, without clogging the emitters, that would kind of be uh, the bees knees here. That's a, that's a really good point, too, that um, I don't think we touched on, is every single plant has got to have a trickle on it. It's got to be fertigated, or it's, it has to be irrigated. So if you're irrigating your entire hop yard, you know, fertigation is just one more step. It's, you're going to have the irrigation set up anyway, so you might as well throw a fertigation tank on it as well. Okay, uh, we have a question now regarding pests. Uh, can you talk about when you do have your aphids or other pests, uh, what organic pesticides have you been successful with? And one grower suggested neem and even a tomato leaf extract. Gotcha. One of the biggest pests that we have are home brewers. <laughs> uh, but other than that, um, we actually use diatomaceous earth. We've um, use that to control our aphid population because they obviously don't have a, um, a hard body. The diatomaceous earth gets on them and it doesn't really kill them but it makes them, makes them very uncomfortable and they leave your yard immediately. We also release um, tens of thousands of ladybugs each year and it's, it's actually pretty, pretty cost effective. We really haven't, haven't had the need to spray this past season because of all the ladybugs out there taking care of um, aphids and spider mites. Um, one other thing that uh, Jeff Steinman has been experimenting with down in um, the Kalamazoo area is predatory mites. Um, it's a little more expensive, but you only need so many predatory mites per um, acre, and they will eat just about every bug in sight. Um, other than just paying attention to your when you till, um, you know, you obviously don't want to till when it's dusty. Um, just common sense really is is what we're using and, and it's working. Okay. That's that's a that's a good valuable lesson right there you shared with us. So 
one one person noticed that the V trellises uh, that you are using versus a single string. What is the uh, is there a true advantage in in yield, and um, how does that impact the spacing in the field? Yeah, there's definitely a, a yield advantage um, because you're getting double the uh, the amount of uh, production that way. So if you're just one, running one string straight up uh, versus two strings in a V, um, I suppose you could plant them closer together if you're um, the rows anyways closer together if you're only using one string. But um, if I was going to build my own hop yard, I would build them 12, 13 feet apart. Two and a half to three feet between plants, and I'm definitely using the uh, trellis system to increase yields. Now you, you are going to have to hang twice as many strings, which is a lot of work um, because those strings come down with the vines every year. So every year you're rehanging strings. Okay, that sounds like good summer jobs for our for our youth who are. And one follow up um, on this on the strings too. We use uh, core. Uh, C O I R. It's basically a coconut rep that we get from Sri Lanka. It um, it goes through our wolf machine, and uh, it's industry standard. You can get them anywhere. There's a place, um, Rolanka, R O L A N K A, is is where we get our core from. But you don't really want to use any kind of plastic. Um, we have experimented with uh, paper ropes, but they just don't help hold up, unfortunately. Okay, thank you, Brian. So a lot of questions have come in about pelletizing the process, and is it necessary, and can it be done by, say, at a, a mill that does pelletizing of other um, food products? This is um, probably where um, you separate the men and the boys or the girls and the ladies, because the, the pelletizing and the processing is it's, it's one. It's very expensive, and two, it really separates. Um, if you want to be catering to the home brewer market, or if you really want to go after uh, the breweries, breweries in Michigan, and the majority of the brewers that I've talked to throughout the, the country, you know, ninety ninety five percent of them will only use pelletized hops. That's not the same for the home brew market. You can get away with um, whole cone. And I actually prefer whole cone. I think it tastes better, but I don't, you know, I don't write the checks for the brewers. We've got to grow what they want. So you've got to have the pelletized system if you're going to go big scale. If not, um, whole cone is fine, but just concentrate on what's going to make you money. We actually had to buy a wolf machine this year, a hammer mill, a pelletizer, a dryer, all that stuff. Um, you know, a a good hammer mill and pelletizer will run you fifteen thousand dollars, and that's just to take a cone and turn it into a little little plug that the brewers can use. With that said, a lot of um, the hops that we sold this year went into harvest ales. So we um, we grew the crops, cut them down, ran them through the wolf machine, and then we ran them to the brewer um, within hours. And we didn't have to pelletize them, but that is uh, you know, your window of opportunity to do that is only a week to 10 days. It, it produ produces a phenomenal beer, but, you know, you can only do that for, you know, a few days out of the entire season. So, you know, if you get the pelletizer, you can definitely make money because you're, you're selling those um, um, pellets to the brewers. But on the other hand, your, the whole cone you can sell to the homebrew market and make just as much money, but you really got to think on what you want to do. What what do you want to get out of this? Okay. You know, how big do you want to be? How how much do you want to invest? I guess is the bottom line. Yeah, and like any crop, Vic, you and I have talked about this before. Know your market before you uh, put any plant in the ground. So a question was asked: What is the approximate cost if you uh, off? You offsite. You mentioned the cost of a pelletizer. What is the cost for if you do it from you know you have it done by a custom pelletizer? I guess. Um, you really have to take it to like up in um, Leland Peninsula where we are. Um, we can do it, or Empire Hops can do it as well. Or when, uh, Old Mission can do it. Um, it usually ranges um, 
you know, a couple dollars um, a pound of pelletize and up depending on who you're using and how much work you want to do. I mean, if if you cut down the plants, bring them to the processing facility and help, you know, through the whole process, it's going to be a lot cheaper than, you know, if we come out, grab it, bring it back, pelletize it, and then give it back to you. So you can save some money there if you're willing to to invest a little sweat equity. But it's it's typically a couple dollars a pound. Okay. And I mentioned in, in, in one of the slides that it's just a dollar fifty in energy cost per pound. So um, don't be surprised if, if folks are charging above and beyond that for their labor. I think Brian and MHA might be a little bit low. All right, a couple of uh, growers are asking for sources of poles. A 22-foot pole is pretty big, and um, does it always have to be, um, are there any other, I mean, we saw what yours looked like, but are there specifics that have to be, or just the fact that it's a strong pole? And the, any sources you could share? Yeah, there should be some resources on there. Um, uh, we use black locusts. Um, they're kind of off the chart in terms of density. Brian mentioned that. Um, you can use cedar poles. Um, it's hard to find those um, that tall. And then I've also heard of folks using uh, red pine. Um, anything untreated um, that is a hardwood or you know a cedar or pine will work. Um, the reason we use black locusts is because they are so hard that they're fairly rot resistant um, and they'll last longer before you have to replace them. And we've got a local source which helps. Yeah, that's, that's for sure. That starts a lot. So uh, we've talked. You've talked a lot about uh, the need for nutrients, especially nitrogen. Have you? Do you have any experience with microorganisms um, inoculating or through any um, compost teas or anything that you've used? No, we haven't. We haven't gotten into that. Um, uh, I know uh, Heather Heather Darby out at uh, University of Vermont. Um, I don't. Know, I think they might be listed on a resource page as well. They've done some tests on uh, uh, compost tea, um, so I'd look up uh, her lab out at the University of Vermont um, for anything you uh, on microorganisms or uh, compost tea on hops in particular. She has done research. Well, good. That's be very interesting. So uh, now a grower is trying to be more. Um, creative and saying, are there, is there farm equipment out there that can be modified to be used as a picker or in any part of the process of uh, producing hops? Well, farmers are pretty crafty people, so I'm not going to say the answer is no, but um, uh, these these picking machines that um, we have here are all imported from Germany. Um, they're, you know, 25 years old, 30 years old. They come over in two pieces and they have to be put back together. Um, from a shipping container, um, so it's a, it's a pretty big cost to get them up and running again, and they're pretty intricate um, pieces of equipment if you've ever seen one run. Um, so I'm not going to say no, uh, I just don't really know what else is out there, and I haven't seen anything else work as well as, uh, as the wolf picking machine that we have here. So some sources of um, that type of equipment, where would it be? I mean, it's not like, you know, there's factories everywhere. Is the wolf machine available in the U.S., for example? Uh, not really. I've heard um, I've heard of uh, folks trying to, or maybe getting into um, a manufacturing one. Um, I don't know where that is in the process, and I'm not really sure, to be honest with you, where MHA, how they got involved in, uh, or even got theirs. Um, Brian, do you want to comment on that? Where you guys got it? Um, there's actually a, a couple guys that are importing them from Germany. Um, probably the best thing to do right now is shoot me an email uh, through our contact, and I can put you in contact with those guys if you're serious. Just keep in mind that um, a 40-year-old wolf machine put back together is going to run you up a good $50,000. So they like to be serious when they get their phone calls. But um, they definitely are out there. I've heard um, they're... Uh, Dan Hauser was or is currently trying to make a domestic version of the Wolf machine um, that we're importing from Germany, but you know it's uh, 150 thousand dollars new. So you know we choose the route um, to go with the used one, and it works works tremendously. I mean, you look at this thing; it's 40 years old, but it's like uh, you know a vintage Mercedes or a BMW. It's just 
you really can't can't beat it. Okay, thanks, Brian. And Brian, have you found anything? Have you d done a season with your low trellis yet, or is it? Are you still? Um, is this the you haven't had a full season yet? Um, this was our first season that we planted. So um, next year will be uh, our second, and we should. The the plants that came through looked great, but um, yeah, it's it's really too early to tell. It's going to be two or three years down the road. If we can identify more short trellis varieties, it, it would certainly be interesting and uh, hopefully profitable to put them in. There's a few other ones besides Summit that are not propri proprietary. Um, I don't think Team Maker is. Team Maker is like a low alpha semi dwarf variety that's grown oddly enough for, for making tea, but um, the results with that have been hit or miss. There are some um, individuals over in England that have uh, been experimenting with these uh, short trellis for you know, a good 10 or 15 years, and I, I'm sorry I don't have that information with us, but um, I could get it to somebody if they're truly interested in uh, pursuing that. So one listener did mention that SAS is not proprietary. So I you know there was a question when you presented that information. Um, yeah, it's, it's SAS isn't proprietary, but I've yet to meet anybody who can grow it successfully in quantity anyway. I mean, maybe one or two plants, but to plant an entire acre, um, it might be um, good money chasing bad. So uh, growers, you know, we have folks that are thinking about a new uh, venture, and maybe this is one of them. Their beginners are asking, what is the typical minimum size of land that you um, suggest for production for commercial sale of the hops of the harvest? Um, that's kind of tough to answer. It really depends on what your market is. If you're going for the homebrew market or for um, for uh, you know some of the microbrews, um, I would just start off small. I'm, everyone has grand ambitions, which is fine. Um, but I would start off with a half an acre, see how much work it is, wait a couple years, see what varieties grow well in your region um, before I jump into anything big. Okay, thanks, Rob. I would agree with that. And um, somebody probably from Michigan wants to know who they should sign up to be a grower member of the association, but perhaps you are familiar, Rob and Brian, with other associations in, in other states, and then you could share how people can be, get in contact with that or find them. Um, honestly, I, um, there's one over in New York. It's uh, the Northeast Hop Alliance, I, I think it is. I, I don't have their contact information. Um, it's, we're the only one in Michigan doing a you know, kind of like a co-op thing, but that doesn't mean there's not other guys who are trying to start up and do that. I'm not trying to be evasive, it's just I, I don't know of any other like hot co-ops in the Midwest. And as far as uh, processing goes, you, you want to make sure that you're fairly close to where the, um, the picking machine processing is. You don't want to be driving four hours you know, with your hops in the trailer to try to get to the picking machine. Um, so what, I think one successful model here that worked is uh, is the Michigan Hop Alliance. They have four or five different growers, and they all split the cost of this equipment and their marketing together um, rather successfully. Okay, thanks. And so I it seems about one more question here. And is there a USDA or even a public germplasm collection repository for hops available? Yeah, there is, and I, I'm hoping it's on that resource list, but if it's not, folks can uh, email me, or it should be up on our um, hops.msu.edu website um, as soon as that's up in the next couple of weeks. I thought that was, in, uh, I tried, um, last year a lot of it was in quarantine, because they had uh, some issues with, um, I don't know, hops on viroid or something like some outbreak out there, so most of them, and uh, germplasm was unavailable last year. Hopefully that's been corrected, but I'm not sure where that is right now. Okay, well, a listener has just shared that there's an Eastern Hops Guild, and it's based in Asheville, North Carolina. And then there's that's also great. North Carolina State University, I guess, has some work going on. And um, huh, 
Pioneer and First Gold are the two UK dwarf varieties, but they're not yet available in the US. Um, so maybe that's something to look forward to. So Pioneer, is that a, uh, would that be, is it a variety that's a GMO, I guess is the question, or is it a um, permitted variety and organic? I don't know. But, you know yeah, I'd have to, it. I'd have to go and, uh, I'd have to go and, and look that one up, um, Vicki, but that one, I do believe is listed in the IPM guide uh, as well. Um, in terms of uh, or the uh, the disease management guide, I'm trying to leave through that right now, but it's on the uh, the PowerPoint right there. Um, it's a bittering hop. It's moderately resistant to powdery mildew and downy mildew. Okay. And then another person has shared another resource that University of Vermont Extension is working on a mobile picker, and they're sharing these plans online. So it's going to be not proprietary construction. Um, yeah, great. Yeah, the University of Vermont has a nice web page too with uh, videos on how to set up a trellis, and uh, Heather Heather Darby is going to done a great job there. Heather, and I think this is a good good final question here or nearabouts is um, how many pounds of pelletized hops would one need before the microbrews will will be interested in buying? What's your what can you anticipate minimum before you can have something to a microbrew for sale? Five. We've sold as as few as five. Five pounds of pelletized hops to um, a microbrewery just to do a one-off. It's not like you need, um, you know, a thousand pounds of of pelletized hops before they'll deal with you because you can do really small batches with, you know, just a handful of pounds. So as long as the quality is there and it's something interesting that you're growing, you know, the bottom line is you you need to develop a relationship with the brewer. Find out, um, and it's not necessarily asking the brewer, well, what do you want us to grow? We've had a lot of the exact opposites. The brewers, a lot of the brewers that we've dealt with is grow the best hop that you can possibly grow, and we will make something out of it. No, yeah, it's very interesting. That could be, yeah, I mean, there, there are certain varieties that they always want, like Simcoe, Amarillo, um, that we simply can't get because it's proprietary. But there's always going to be a need for a Cascade, a Centennial, Chinook. As long as the quality is, the quality is there, that's the bottom line. And who do you get to test your um, test your hops for quality? Uh, we send everything to Hop Union. Just overnight it, and it's like um, thirty-five dollars, I think, for uh, an alpha, a basic alpha and beta test. And they do a great job there. They'll tell you if you have any off off colors or off flavors, or if it wasn't dried enough. Um, they do a really great job there. I think they might have morphed off into is it Alpha Analyticals? Yeah, uh, but Hop Union uh, is is where we were sending our our test to last year. They do a great job. Okay, thank you. So I guess I we have one more. MSU may be looking at doing some oh. some testing at some year. So some questions have come in about uh, redescribing the cover crop system, and where, if you grow it in between rows or the whole field, or um, and then the varieties the, or the species, the buckwheat and clovers that you use, um, how are they used as more for weed inhibition or fertilizer? Just want a little more detail um, on the cover crop. Yeah, a little bit of both. What we do is we'll go in um, a year before we plant the hops, put in a cover crop like buckwheat or rye or something just to um, start choking out the weeds. Our biggest problem is quackgrass. So we go in there with buckwheat, which is kind of like nature's roundup, Get, a, get rid of all the weeds and then go in there with either uh, white or red mammoth clover, something that's not going to grow more than, you know, a foot tall because you can run into the problems with the clover choking out your the crowns of your hops. But after the second year, you really don't have to, to worry about weed, weed pressure that much because your crowns are going to start taking over and choking out all the other weeds. So... We use clover everywhere, in the drive rows, in, in, um, in the plants, but we'll also do, you know, some drive row mixtures or tree foil um, as well. Just, you know, experiment. That's what we're doing. We've got, you know, eight different cover crops that we're experimenting with just to see what's growing. So far, um, clover looks like it's going to be the best and with a, um, a, a cover crop before uh, buckwheat. That could change too, but preliminary, preliminary, 
right now that's what we see. Okay, thanks. And um, just kind of an interesting question, maybe more food for thought. A couple unique systems. One is asking about any knowledge of animal traction and then also knowledge of having hops integrated with a permaculture system. Can you repeat that first one? I didn't understand that. Sure. Uh, animal any, any knowledge of um, animal traction being used in management of hops? I'm not, I guess I don't understand what animal traction is. Oh, is it just using uh, like animal, uh, horses animal to pull plow. up? Animal plow. Yeah. Yeah, oh, animal um, plow. Okay. Um, the, the the only animals that I've seen used um, you could you could definitely do that. Um, the only animals I've seen used in hops are sheep um, that they use over in New Zealand for uh, uh, kind of stripping the bottom parts of the uh, the plants. Um, I I don't think I'd use goats because they'll just eat the whole thing. Uh, but sheep, from what I've heard, uh, do fairly well. And then what was the second question, Mickey? Um, have you ever seen hops integrated into a permaculture system? Not yet, but I'm sure folks are doing it somewhere out there. I just haven't seen it kind of on a commercial basis. Okay. And um, I get a few questions from folks. If they're interested in participating in any on-farm research here in Michigan or even elsewhere, what's their best approach to, to find out about participating? Well, um, I would first of all investigate the SARE grant, um, Sustainable Ag Research and Education, uh, in your region. Um, we're in the North Central region, and they've given out a few different grants for farmers to uh, do their own research. Um, and I think they've given out three or four on hops in particular. So if you're interested in trying something new on your farm with hops, and you don't really know if it's going to work, um, and it meets that kind of triple bottom line, environment, economics, and uh, social, then go ahead and look at that, because um, Brian got one of those, along with Michigan Hop Alliance. Um, as far as the other kind of uh, larger scale research projects, um, those are mostly going to be run out of the universities. So if you have, uh, like if North Carolina State is doing work, find out who the person is there who's uh, doing work on hops and uh, establish a relationship with them and uh, offer up your, your site uh, for research. There are pluses and minuses for doing research. Um, typically the way research plots are set up, uh, they have to be uh, you know, randomized replicated trials. So um, it's not typically the way you would set up a hop yard by uh, uh, putting you know 20 different varieties in the same row. It's not ideal for harvest. Um, so there are pluses and minuses working with uh, with researchers. Um, but uh, we try to do our best to uh, accommodate the growers' needs as well. And you know that's kind of the the way it goes with on farm research. Looks like Brian's got a little point here too. One thing I would follow up with as well is if um, you're a farmer who just uh, is interested in seeing a hop yard, any of the growers that we deal with um, here in northern Michigan, you can come out anytime basically and you know take a look around, see what it entails. If you want to come out and hang rope or you know whatever, just you know come out and bring some beer. We'll definitely show you around. Yeah, we also do a tour every year, uh, Vicky, up here that you were part of last year, um, generally in August. And then we fill up a bus or two, um, take folks around to uh, different hop yards, um, explain our research trials, um, uh, look at the processing equipment, and then we do an educational tasting, generally. I learned lots that day. <laughs> um, so regarding the different diseases that you uh, have experienced, are you... Um, Finding that the organic can, organic system can really manage that, or are you losing? You know, what, what do you think your uh, score is, if you will, um, of your viruses or not viruses, but so much, but the pathogens, the plant path pathogens, to treatment versus loss of plants? Are you successful? And um, and if you know of any other states doing research on diseases on hops. Our trials here in, in northern Michigan have been um, extremely successful, but our biggest problem is yields. Um, our yield is still half of what a conventional yard is, and we're not yet recognizing that premium. So um, it's difficult. Um, you know, I can't 
tell everybody to go out there and farm organically and they're going to get rich doing it unless they can get a premium and you know it's tough it's it's certainly tough but our trials have been very very promising if we can get the yields up and get more um, compost and, and nitrogen working for us and get the soils built up um, that would be a, a, a huge step in the right direction and the fact that in 2013 any certified organic brewery has to use certified organic hops so maybe at that point we will start seeing a premium as far as universities go um, like we mentioned Vermont already uh, Vermont Extension um, and uh, Colorado State um, uh, Ron um, Godin Colorado State was working on hops uh, organic production um, Washington State, Kevin Murphy, uh, there's also folks in uh, Oregon, David Gent works for USDA ARS. So there's folks doing research um, all over the country and it sounds like North Carolina State as well. Well thank you Rob and Brian. Um, I just wanted to remind everyone um, that um, the slides and the recording of this presentation will be posted um, within the next day or two at the link at the top of your screen. It's now the correct link. And um, you can register for upcoming webinars and view recorded webinars at the second link on your screen. And if you have additional question ask after the webinar, you can use the e-extension Ask an Expert service. Um, finally, we'll be sending out a follow-up survey after the webinar, so we'd really appreciate it if you could give us your feedback and fill that out. Well, thank you so much, um, Vicki, and thank you so much, Rob and Brian, for coming today and presenting this webinar, and thank you all for joining us. Thank you for hosting, Alice.